Good morning. Today on Spotlight, an interview with Dawood Wali, Executive Director of the Council of Arab Islamic Relations, Michigan Chapter. And later on our Sunday morning program, I'll sit down with Bankale Thompson, Detroit journalist and Dean of the Pulse Institute. His new book gives insight into the major issues facing this year's political environment. It's Sunday, April the 14th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight. Have you ever seen a more tense time than what we're living in now? Well, the only parallel I can draw, Chuck, is right after 9-11. Mm -hmm. I think this is one of the most tense times that we've had in our country in general, polarized, uh, not just in relationship to what's going on in, uh, in Gaza, but just the general climate when we're talking about uh, immigration uh, and other things, social economic issues, has probably been I think the most polarizing time uh, in my work, uh, specifically for Muslims, but on a broad scale, I think our country is more divided now than like right at the time of 9-11 for sure. Which is a great segue into the recent report that CARE Michigan put out in terms of Islamophobia. Uh, the numbers have spiked, correct? Yes, uh, according to our data, the Council on American Islamic Relations nationally, since the 30 years the organization has been in existence, 2023 was the highest number of intakes in the history of the organization, including uh, the year uh, uh, that came after 9-11. As far as the Michigan chapter, we have our own sub-report, and uh, our chapter has been open since 2000. And again, it's been the worst year in our history as well. Uh, there was a significant spike in particular nationwide and in Michigan in the last three months of the year and we make a direct correlation between what has gone on overseas and in Gaza in particular with the increasement of anti-Muslim sentiment. So for instance, only a few days after October 7th, a Farmington Hills man was arrested and charged with making terroristic threats because he put out that he wanted to kill all the Palestinians in Dearborn, for instance. That's one example, right? Uh, another example is about a month ago, uh, a man was uh, charged federally with threatening to kill everyone in my office, mm -hmm. right? So these are actually uh, incidences or issues where we heard about these from law enforcement and or uh, our contact with law enforcement, not necessarily constituents directly calling uh, our office. This has got to be awfully frustrating for someone such as yourself and those you represent because of the years of hard work that you've put in to try to address this issue as well as race relations and interacted with um, Muslims and non-Muslims to be able to say, we're all in this country together and it behooves us to try to get along. But when you put that amount of work in and then you see these numbers escalate like this, um, it's got to be depressing. Well, it's a challenge for sure. But again, I go back to we are at an all time, I believe, high as far as divisiveness in the social political discourse in our country in general. So then when we have these niche issues or, or certain issues that affect us as Muslims, uh, then they're just a broader toxic environment in which people are quick to react, to demonize people or to dehumanize other people. And this leads to things such as the attack that took place in Chicago land where there was a stabbing where a landlord stabbed two Palestinian Muslims in killing a, a, a nine-year-old, uh, right? And, and this landlord knew those people, right, right for instance, yeah. or the, the three Palestinians uh, Muslims who were shot in Vermont, or then there was a stabbing uh, of, a, of a Palestinian in, in Texas, uh, threats against our uh, Islamic centers uh, right here in, in southeastern Michigan, right? But these are individuals, I people, uh, who I think that are on the edge to begin with uh, in regards to the social political environment that's really toxic in our nation right now. All right, we need to take a quick little pause for a cause. We'll come right back, look at what may be some of the solutions to what we're dealing with right now, as well as reaction and the impact that it may have on a very big political election year. We'll be right back with Dawood Waleed right after this. Council General for Israel was on our 
Black Spotlight program last week. And he was citing the fact that he acknowledged that Islamophobia, as you said, is on the rise and polling is showing that. He also cited the fact that anti-Semitism is on the rise. Uh, and he said there's no place for either one of them. But your thoughts on the fact that it's rising on both sides and what, if anything, can be done about it? What should be done about it? Well, I mean, there's a couple of things that could be done. I mean, number one, uh, facially speaking, right, that political leaders and faith leaders as well as community activists have to be more responsible uh, with their language. And this also includes policing people with inside of our own ethnic uh, communities, inside of our own religious communities, that uh, we can talk about um, criminal offenses, right? We can talk about uh, certain injustices that take place, but it can't be a total like smearing or dehumanizing of, of a group of people. So we have to be very careful uh, with our words. Right, and uh, the moment in which we cut off dialogue between different communities, um, then the dehumanization process begins to speed up. But I also say one thing too, right? Definitions do matter, right? So for instance, um, I don't believe it to be anti-Semitic if someone criticizes war crimes uh, that the state of Israel commits, right? Or to say that, as some people would say, that they believe that uh, the Netanyahu government, or even what called the Netanyahu regime, to even criticize what it's been doing or call what's going on a genocide, that that somehow equals some sort of inherent anti-Semitism uh, amongst Arabs and Muslims. So I would say, I, I think sometimes the definitions do matter. And uh, from our perspective, uh, criticism of illegal occupation, criticism of war crimes, uh, use of white phosphorus, cutting off water, 70% uh, of the casualties being women and children, to criticize that and say that Israel, its, its military government, is involved in genocide, I don't consider it to be anti-Semitic at all. But some people in the Jewish community uh, do consider that to be uh, anti-Semitic anti rhetoric. So along that thread, uh, the USA Today recently did a very detailed journalistic report showing what Gaza looked like before October 7th attack and what Gaza looks like now. Do you believe that this has become more than tit for tat and that the Netanyahu administration is using what happened on October 7th to be able to commit almost a complete genocide and wholesale killing in terms of Palestinians? I think that the Netanyahu uh, government, number one, was on its last leg to begin with. There were mass protests before October 7th. People were calling for him uh, to be ousted. Uh, so October 7th, in an ironic way, gave him a little bit of time or life support in regards to uh, his government, which is seen to be uh, corrupt and undemocratic. And you're suggesting that, that he's using a war situation to help boost his him politically in terms of how he's viewed in a country in which he was in political danger, according to many. Well, he definitely was in political danger, there's no doubt about it. But there's also some other things that we put on that there's been uh, a reporting that there are people or individuals who have already talked about wanting to sell properties in North Gaza to Israelis. Jared Kushner himself said that that area of North Gaza would be very good beachfront property, right, to be able for development. So it, it is the belief of many people in the Muslim community that Mr. Netanyahu has, uh, in a sick way, used the October 7th attack, which of course we don't uh, condone any attack against civilians, right, women and children. We don't condone that whatsoever, but use that as a pretext for a type of expansionist type of mentality uh, that he has. Uh, like I, I believe that man is, is a complete warmonger, and so he's benefited politically, but even outside of him being political para, peril, uh, I, I believe that he's, a, he, he's an expansionist uh, war criminal. Uh, God forbid if he actually does give the green light for ground troops and ground invasion in, in Rafa in that dense area where all the Palestinians are at, it will be an utter bloodbath and it will surpass 
the over 32,000 people that have been killed thus far, uh, exponentially. The role that the Biden administration has played on this very sensitive issue, have they been strong enough? Has he made the right call to action or has he turned his back on Palestinians and people who may have voted for him four years ago uh, and maybe now have the position of he's not the right person to lead uh, this issue and America going forward? Well, I think that if we look at the Michigan Democratic primary, Chuck, and the unprecedented amount of people who voted uncommitted in the Democratic primary, that that was a signal that many people who voted for him in the previous election and part of the base uh, is totally displeased with him. And to the extent that in the Muslim community in Michigan, also in Minnesota and around the country, uh, where there was an, a high amount of people who voted uncommitted, people uh, have started a movement called Abandon Biden. And now we have talk in our community in which our community overwhelmingly voted for Mr. Biden uh, in the last election. Uh, people are now saying that Mr. Biden and the Democratic Party needs to be taught a, lection, uh, a lesson and then that if Trump becomes the next president, uh, then so be it. But there needs to be political consequences uh, for uh, what is believed to be uh, political betrayal uh, by the Biden administration and the Democratic Party in general. So we have to wait and see uh, what's going on in November. But uh, I think that he has lost a significant amount of Arab and Muslim votes uh, in, uh, for the election in, in November, not just in Michigan, but in Pennsylvania, uh, Minneapolis, and, and other parts of and do the you see And do you see those votes going to former President Trump, um, who also, when he was in office as president, said that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu did not have a better friend than Donald Trump? Uh, so do you see that there would be a vast difference or do you think people will just sit the election out and not vote for either candidate? Well, ironically, Mr. Trump has even said that Netanyahu has gone too far, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, that he's made uh, uh, matters worse uh, for himself and for, and for Israel. And I'm paraphrasing those words. I think that many uh, people in the community will most likely uh, either vote third party mm -hmm. or they may skip voting for president all together and just vote for local elections, vote for their state rep, uh, vote for their rep who's uh, going to D.C. in Congress and maybe may skip. There will be some people, of course, who will continue to vote for Mr. Biden, and there will be some who will vote for Mr. Trump as well. But I, I think that uh, there's uh, uh, talk in our community. I think I know there's talk in our community about Dr. Cornell West. Uh, he's been to this community more than one time. He's met with uh, community leaders. He's uh, spoken. Uh, in, in public forums, including in Dearborn, uh, specifically addressing Muslims and the concerns of the community. And so there may be an issue of uh, people so, just deciding to vote third party. So there may be protest votes, even with no labels party saying they're throwing the towel in because they weren't able to find a candidate. There will be other names out there that people may vote for, even if they feel they may not have a good chance at winning. It's sort, of, it's sort of a protest vote. Yeah, I believe so. And, you know, I've been asked this question by uh, national, even international media, uh, where they say, well, if Muslims uh, vote for a third party candidate, isn't, isn't that like voting for Trump? And my response is that it is the responsibility of the candidate to earn the vote of our community. So, we, so the Muslims should not be blamed if Mr. Biden loses Michigan and thus loses the presidential election because it is up to the Biden administration to earn the vote of the Muslim community. Muslims can't be politically blackmailed or scapegoated into voting uh, for, for, for Mr. Biden. Now, of course, as our organization, we don't endorse anyone. We are a nonprofit 501c3 organization. But I'm just giving you a pulse of the community in general that people are saying, no, Mr. Biden has to, has to earn our vote. We're just not gonna give him a vote again uh, of the so-called lesser than two evils because uh, we didn't vote, uh, the community didn't vote for Trump in the last election. All right, we'll see what happens between now and November. Dawood Wali, thank you so much for coming in and sharing all these opinions, we appreciate it. And coming up, Detroit journalist, Bankale Thompson, Dean of the Pulse Institute.
the dean of the Pulse Institute. You can also read his column in the Detroit News. And now he's got a new book, uh, the newest book, I yes. should say, <laughs> uh, called Fiery Conscience. Uh, tell me about this book and, and, and that word conscience. Um, yeah. is prevalent throughout this book right. and I would say plays a big role in the backdrop of what may be the most interesting, perhaps the most important presidential election in recent history. Uh, no, no question, Chuck. Thanks for having me. Uh, fiery conscience, it's basically a, an, an aggregation of stories uh, that I have covered, you know, for decades in this town. Uh, told through the lens of individuals who have been impacted by those stories, mm -hmm. uh, people who have gone through a lot in life and came into contact with me. I wrote stories about their lives and it, and it got transformed, sure. you know, in the media business. That's what we're supposed to do. Say that the media can be a force for good. I didn't say it is a force for good. Can be a force for <laughs> it good. Because, can, yeah, yeah, it can be because you know, word. yeah, we get we get criticized all the time about you know not covering the right stories, not telling the right stories, and I believe that the media can be a force for good. And this book, Fiery Con Conscience, is a template of that. Immigration, abortion. We're hearing these big topics uh, bantered about uh, every right. time you talk about this election. Um, but up underneath that. Is race something that you have written about for mm. quite some time? Is that the elephant in the room? Race is the big elephant here in the room. And who, whoever of the candidates is able to really pick apart, you know, not even a large segment, but just a considerable amount of black voters could, you know, could potentially win this election. So I think uh, race is, is a dominant factor in this, re in this election. Do you feel as though people of color are engaged in this election, or do you feel so? Eh, neither neither party has really represented us well, so we just may sit on our hands and not vote at all. Well, you know th that's the problem. That let's take Democrats for example. That's the problem that they are facing. This this long time what I call disengagement, or this long time wanting to come to the black community whenever it is convenient. You know, uh, black people are considered the convenient electoral base. Uh, we will get to them when we can uh, and, and w when we are ready. And so you have on the Republican side, you have Donald Trump who is out there on the campaign trail uh, talking about how black people can ad identify with him because he's facing uh, the, the criminal justice system. This is the the post-Trump age, mm -hmm. and, and, and things are different. And people are looking at their lives, Chuck. They're saying, look, you know, uh, the last four years, you know, how, 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 have, how have our lives been improved? You know, what has happened to us? You know, uh, you know, have our mortgages gone up? You know, inflation, the economy, criminal justice, you know, uh, black business, and so forth. These are litany of issues that a lot of people are dealing with. And so that's why I think it's important for Democrats, you know, who always talk about how they own the real estate of black voters. They need to move beyond the periphery. They need to move beyond a bubble and, and, and start talking to black voters and not just wait until after the convention. All right, hang on one second. Got to get a quick little pause for the calls in here. We'll come right back. I want to get your opinion on the role that uh, Arab Americans and Hispanic Americans may play in this year's election. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Bankley, uh, we have seen protest vote by Arab Americans in primary elections from state to state because of what's going on in the Mideast situation. We are seeing people um, concerned about what's happening in Ukraine as well. Uh, but we are also seeing Hispanic Americans, which are uh, growing by leaps and bounds, yeah. uh, getting a lot more politically active. Might they be the minority groups, and I say that with quotes around them, right. that could tip this election one way or the other, Democrat or Republican? Well, you know, I, I honestly think that each of these groups are very important. Uh, the Arab American vote, the, 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 the Latino vote, are very significant to the Democratic coalition. And if Democrats cannot, uh, you know, ensure that they keep that coalition in check, if there is friction, if this friction continues, we see a friction. And then at least on the Arab American side, oh, yeah, it to seems to be very fragile. Oh, right oh to totally, totally. And I don't think the Democratic administration, I don't think the Biden White House, uh, uh, Democrats have handled that well. You know, and I think that if this friction continues, 
all the way into October, it could be very telling for Democrats. Uh, they need the Hispanic vote. They need the Arab American vote. They can't afford to lose or they can't even afford for the opposition to actually make a significant dent in those communities. You've always written eloquently about right. the role of the economy. Right. Will this economy play a major role in this election or are these other issues, immigration, abortion, you name it, are uh, the world stage, are they, um, no pun intended, are right. they trumping the economic issues? Well, I think the economic issue is going to play is going to play largely because people are still, you know, we're still dealing with the remnants of the inflation. Uh, prices have gone up. Yeah. Commodities, price of commodities have gone up. People so, feel it when they go to the oh, to, gas station oh, oh, to totally, fill up their tanks. Totally, totally. When we go to the gas station, we feel it. So I think the economy is going to be a big role here. And, and it, it could be a decider. Now, there's, there's no question. But the Biden administration the is arguing you're a whole lot better off now with me driving this economy than you were when I took over after President Trump that is, lost that, the last election. That is true, but Biden ought to be not only the president, the commander-in-chief, but he also needs to be the explainer-in-chief. Are Republicans better at messaging? They, they are. They are. They are. I, I, I think I, I'll give them that credit. I think Republicans are better at messaging. I, I think they know how to rally the base. Uh, they don't take their base for granted. Uh, they, will, they will die on the hill, on top of the hill, defending their base. Democrats Even always. Even if they don't like the personality of their leading candidate, they fall in line. They do. Because they, they do. May like the policies. They do, that because it, it sometimes it appears to be almost a cult politics, if you will. But Democrats, they want to play both sides. And, and sometimes they, you know, they, 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 they hold back before they really declare their embrace of, you know, of, of the different uh, groups that make up the Democratic coalition. So I think this is where we are. Biden has to try to be the explainer in chief, not just the commander in chief. All right, time's always our worst enemy. Uh, the book is called Fiery Conscience by uh, Bankale Thompson. Uh, feel free to pick it up. Uh, Forbes magazine uh, recently wrote a nice review about it as well. And we got a long time between now and November. We'll get you back. Thank you so much. All right. And I'm Chuck Stokes. We'll be back next week with more Newsmakers in the Spotlight. We hope you have a great week.